book. We're going to be reading Philemon tonight. And as we read Philemon, there's a simple truth that we find here in this book. The simple truth is that we find the gospel applied. As we think about the gospel, what does that mean to you? When someone asks you the question, what is the gospel? How do you answer that question? Hopefully tonight as we go through this book, we will see how the gospel can be applied in us, through us, and ultimately as we think about Christ and what he has done for us, we see truly how the gospel has been applied for us. This, this letter is steeped with gospel truth. So as we turn to this letter and we think about how the gospel is applied, let's pray that God would show us these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth that does not come back to you void. Thank you for the way it speaks to us. And I pray, Lord, tonight that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to us through a broken vessel, to see the truth that you might have for us, to see here in this short and sweet book, Philemon. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Philemon, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved brother, and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet... For love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you, that you owe to me even your own life as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time also, prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark. Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. 
Well, it's complicated. You've probably heard that before in your families, friends, other relationships with neighbors. What makes relationships complicated? If we're honest, it's probably, we can say it's the other person, it's the other party. But truly, more oftentimes than not, the problem with the relationship usually is with us. There are things that we need to do to seek to have both restoration and reconciliation. And this is what Paul is seeking here in this letter. This is what is driving his appeal that we see in this letter. This is the reason he is giving this letter to this man, Philemon. But how do we go about restoring relationships and developing true reconciliation in those relationships? So that's the question, again, that Paul is facing between the two people, Philemon and Onesimus. So what if we were a fly on the wall listening to the conversation leading up to this letter? I would imagine it would go something like this. Well, it's complicated. As Onesimus would come to Paul. And this is what he would say. You see, I'm a, I'm a fugitive slave. I'm a slave because I have a debt that I can't pay or I couldn't pay. And on top of that, I'm a fugitive because I ran away, and, I'm, and I, when I ran away, I also took something that I, I shouldn't have. So, yeah, the, his, his name was Philemon. And then we could hear Paul say, wait a minute, what was his name? Philemon? Where'd you, where'd you say you're from? Colossae? God really does work in mysterious ways. I helped start that church. I know Philemon very well. And I think I have these two letters here, Ephesians and Colossians, to these two churches. Maybe you can go with Tychicus and drop these off for me. And Onesimus would, you don't understand, I'm a fugitive slave. I can't go back there. Remember? And we could hear Paul in this imaginary discourse thinking through him, Onesimus, as a son, a child, him as a father, turning to him and saying, I do remember. I remember that you were enslaved to sin, but now you're enslaved to righteousness. I remember that, yes, you, you have these problems, but don't forget what Christ has done for you. And go and be reconciled to your brother, to Philemon. So let's look at how this could come about. We see this imaginary discourse. We don't actually know what happened leading up to this letter. But the question comes from Onesimus to Paul. How can I do this? I hear you say I need to do this, but how? And that's the same question that comes to us as we look at this text tonight. How do we apply the gospel truths? Paul is saying essentially to Onesimus, You know the truth of the gospel. You have now become a Christian. Do you believe that? Then go. See the gospel applied in you, in your heart, through you, through a situation even like this, and remember what Christ has done for you. And so that's what I see. And I believe as we look at this letter to Philemon, it's actually also a huge and great encouragement to Onesimus who can go and see that this letter written by Paul's hand was also for him. So let's see these three ways the gospel applied to us, in us, through us, and for us. So the first way that we see the gospel applied to us, we look at verses 1 through 7 as we see the gospel applied to us. In us, we want to put ourselves in Philemon's shoes. Remember, this is, as it says in verse 1, written by Paul and the co-author, Timothy, to Philemon. 
And we see, begin to see a resume, as it is, with Philemon. We see in verse 2, he's a beloved brother, a fellow worker. And we also see who this is to, not just to Philemon, but also to Aphia and Archippus, who some believe this may actually be his wife and his son. We don't know this for certain, but it, it makes sense that this will be a letter not just to Philemon, but it's, it's to the whole household as we see that they have a church in their house. This is an encouragement not just to Philemon, but the whole household, even the whole church in the house, to receive this man, Onesimus, back. So reading this whole section, we can see this partial but significant resume. So again, as I've already said, the, we see his a beloved brother, a fellow worker. We also see in verse 4 that Paul reveres him in prayer. In verse 5, we see that he's renowned for his love of others and his faith in God. In verses 6 and 7, we see that he is known for his refreshing partnership in the gospel. These are the qualifications we see in this man, Philemon. The question to us, as we think about the gospel applied in us, do we see these same qualifications of us? Are we beloved brothers and sisters, faithful to God, loving others, renowned in the way that we do love others and we or so loving that others are refreshed by us and pray for us. The question to us, is this, is this our spiritual resume as it is Philemon? So a story, there was a man in colonial times in America from Germany. He came over and was, was trained in the Reformed tradition. He came over and was ordained shortly after in the Presbyterian Church. He did, shortly after that, become what was called a dunker in the Seventh-day Baptist camp. We don't hold that against him. What we're looking at is what we know him for. He walked 60 miles through the snow in Pennsylvania to go knock on a gentleman's door. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read you the story as it unfolds. This man, his name was Peter Miller says he was a small man with long snow white hair falling over his shoulders. His face, although full of kindliness, was sad looking and thoughtful. His eyes, which were bright and sharp, were upon the ground and lifted only when he was speaking. After knocking on the door, his name was announced. Peter Miller, certainly show him in, George Washington said. Washington, I've come a long way to ask a great favor of you, he said in his usual kindly tones. I shall be glad to grant you almost anything, said Washington, for surely we are indebted to you for many favors. Tell me what it is. I hear, said Peter, that Michael Whitman has been found guilty of treason and that he is to be hanged at Turk's Head tomorrow. I've come to ask pardon upon him. Washington started back, and a cloud came over his face. That's impossible, he said. Whitman is a bad man. He has done all in his power to betray us. He has even offered to join the British and aid in destroying us. In these times, we cannot be lenient with traitors, and for that reason, I cannot pardon your friend. Friend, cried Peter. He is no friend of mine. He is my bitterest enemy. He has persecuted me for years. He has even beaten me and spit in my face, knowing full well that I would not strike back. Michael Whitman is no friend of mine. Washington naturally was puzzled. And you still wish to pardon him? I do, answered Peter. I ask of it of you as a great personal favor. Well, tell me, Washington said with a hesitating voice, why is it that you ask the pardon of your worst enemy? I ask it because Jesus did as much for me, was the old man's brief answer. Washington turned away and went into another room. Soon he returned with paper 
on which was written the pardon of Michael Whitman. My dear friend, he said, as he placed, the old, it, placed it in the old man's hand, I thank you for this great example of Christian charity. It said that Miller then walked another 15 miles after walking 60 in the snow to get to the scaffold just in time. And as the pardon was announced, Whitman was released and the two men walked back together, back to their hometown 75 miles away. So Peter Miller was known for his renowned love of others, his faith in God. Because of that, he was able to pardon his worst enemy. That shows Peter Miller's spiritual resume. It shows the gospel is applied in him. How do we see that in our lives as well? We see that in Philemon's life on the pages of Scripture. How do we see that in our lives written in the way that we live. These men, by Lehman, as well as Peter Miller, are refreshing men. They're revered in prayer, renowned for their love. We see the gospel applied in them this way. So learning of these markers, how then do we see the gospel not only applied in us, we start to see then the gospel applied through us. As the gospel happens, in our life, as, as our lives are changed, what do we do? What is, what is the first thing that we typically want to do? Or looking back, that we may have done. We want to tell someone of this great news of glad deliverance of what God has done in us and what he's doing through us. That's an example of what we see, wanting to tell this great news. Of course, we do this because it is good news, but... Where do we find Onesimus Onesimus here now in the scripture? If we look at verses 8 through 16, we begin to see how Philemon could be certain that this gospel has made its way into Onesimus. This is the appeal that Paul is putting before Philemon. How can Philemon trust this man? He didn't pay the debt off through the work that he was supposed to, and he ran away, and... As we see in verse 18, there's, as people think, maybe he took some things that weren't his on the way out the door. How can he trust that this is true? How can he trust that this has actually happened? This is Paul's letter of pardon on behalf of Onesimus, saying, hear it from me. And with that, we see in verse 10, he's been reborn. Onesimus, as he says, is my child. I have begotten him. I have fathered him in my imprisonment. This is the same language we see in John 3, Nicodemus, where Christ tells him, you can't come into the kingdom of God until you've been born again. How does that happen? Nicodemus wondered. It's a mystery, but... This is the same mystery that Paul brings up here. This is proof he's been reborn. He is my child. But on top of that, in verses 11 and 12, we see that he has been reformed. As we think about that, really before we think about his reformation, how he's been changed, let's think about that idea of him being a child, a child of Paul. What is that word that we would describe this as? It's discipleship, right? So for all of us here with children, whether they're infants all the way to adults, we understand what it means to rear or to to raise the next generation, our children. What? is happening here in a sense, in a spiritual sense. Paul is saying, these are my two boys, my two sons, Philemon and Onesimus. And he's saying, Philemon, the older brother, in a, in a sense, I'm asking you to raise or to disciple this brother of yours. He's handing them over. That is, that's another layer of trust. 
if Philemon is wanting to know, is Onesimus real? Is he really following the Lord? Paul is, is putting his name on the line. This is my son. Raise him, even as I have raised you, Philemon. So with that, we know he's been changed. That's Paul's, he's leading up to his plea. So in verse 11, Paul says that before, he didn't live up to his name. His name, Onesimus, literally means useful. Before, he wasn't useful to you. But now, he's useful to you and to me. Ultimately, he's he's useful to the kingdom of God. He's saying he was a slave, but he's been changed into a new man. And then he even gives his own resounding love by saying, I'm sending you, in verse 12, my very heart. He's, he's just keeps backing Onesimus up. So again, this is an encouragement not just to Philemon, but Onesimus as well. So he's been reborn, he's been changed, reformed, and then reconciled. It says in verse 16 that because of these things, he's saying, Philemon, be reconciled to Onesimus. Receive him back as you would receive me. And this is a crucial point. Things uh, within the history of reading this text get a little, I'll say, dicey. Um, as we think about verses 8 and 9, I'm, I'm going back here on purpose. And there's an issue that I want to point out. Now, Paul is appealing on behalf of the love for Philemon to receive Onesimus. Do you see what he's doing here? I've been building it up, so maybe so. But Paul says, I could order you, but rather I appeal to you for love's sake. This is an appeal by Paul where he decides not to use his authority as an apostle to lord it over Philemon to do what he has to do, what he must do. But he says, in love, I appeal to you. I believe what he's doing is he's saying, I could use my authority over you to make you do what you're supposed to do in the same way you could use your authority over Onesimus. But remember, don't see him as a slave. See him as your brother. Don't use authority over him and lord it over him, but love him. So we see this appeal for a true reconciliation between these two brothers who are truly now brothers. But the situation I want to bring up just quickly revolves around Onesimus as a slave because it's given unneeded dissension through the years. The situation, at least as we know, is that Onesimus, as we've already said, is a bond slave. He has a debt that he needed to pay and he is a fugitive slave. He has ran off. But we remember this is not the same kind of sordid past that we see in our American slavery system. This is a man that owed a debt, and he was working to pay it off, and he ran away. So this, even though this was something that we might have seen more common in that time, it's still hard for us to to think through. But also another scriptural story we can think of is Jacob. He worked as a slave for many years, searching for a great desire for his future wife under the master Laban, who was not a good master. But that's not the situation we see here with Philemon. Philemon was a good man. We see that in his resume that we've already read. So this is Paul's appeal to come to him and say, remember your salvation, Philemon that he was your slave. But remember that you too were once enslaved to sin. Remember what Christ has done for you. So that's why we say this portion until now because it leans us into this plot thickening in verse 19. It tells us that just as Onesimus was a child under the care and discipleship of Paul, so is Philemon. So that's where we come to our final point. 
as we see the gospel applied for us in verses 17 through 20. So this has been the appeal. This is what the whole letter is leading up to. This is what the whole letter is for. As we look at these words from Paul, it's easy to see them as a plea, not only as a plea, that is, but also a prayer. We read them 2,000 years later. And again, we remember, we too were once slaves in bondage to sin. There's a debt that we have that is due to our sin that we can never pay off, no matter how hard we work. But we remember scriptures like Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, because of his rich mercy, because of his great love in which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together in Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Through grace. Excuse me. For by grace you have been saved. Then also in Romans 6, you are no longer enslaved to sin, but you are enslaved to righteousness. But even also, and more powerfully so in some ways, the words of Christ in John 8, 34, I no longer call you slave, but brother. So imagine then that Paul isn't making a plea on behalf of Onesimus to Philemon, but let's read it in a new context. Let's read it as if Christ is making a plea on behalf of you and me before our Heavenly Father. Let's read it with that in mind. In verse 17, as if Christ is reading, he would say, If then, Father, you regard me, a partner, your fellowship, your, our fellowship together, if I abide in you, as John 15 says, then accept them, my church, as you would me. But if they have wronged you in any way or owe you anything, Charge it to my account. I, Christ, I'm writing this with my own hand. In the covenant he made before the foundation of the world and with the sealed blood of that covenant on the cross, he says, I will repay it. And he has repaid it. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of the gospel for us as we see the message of the gospel applied in us, and it begins to work through us, more and more we begin to see the truth of the gospel as it happened for us. And it changes our perspective moving forward. So looking back at our our friend, Peter Miller, as he has pardoned his enemy, Michael Widman, As we said, due to his renowned love of others and faith in God, he was able to see the pardon of his worst enemy. His worst enemy, who he then walks side by side with for 75 miles back home through the snow. I can only imagine how refreshing this man, Peter Miller, would have been to Michael Whitman, who if he was a praying man, which I would hope he would be after this, he would always look back every time he prayed and thank God for that man, Peter Miller, right? And even despite himself and his hateful acts towards Miller, after years of his mocking, this pardoned traitor sees this man, Peter Miller, in a completely different way. And I would imagine his days were different from then on out as well. So the question to us, questions as we think about this text tonight, what is getting in the way of the gospel being applied in you today? Today you can be pardoned and forgiven. All your past debts in a spiritual sense can be erased, as Pete talked about last Sunday morning to us. Not only erased, but we're given an eternal bank balance that is ever increasing in Christ. You may feel that you are someone that no one is going to be thankful for in your prayers. That you would not be refreshing to anyone. That you feel like you're a drain on everyone around you. But take heart. Hear the call of the good news of Christ Jesus 
respond in faith to him because you too can see the gospel applied in you today. What about what is getting in the way of you seeing the gospel applied through you today? So you're a Christian, you have broken relationships with your spouse, with your kids, with your neighbor. Well, it's complicated. It's not, right? It's simple. The simple truth is the same as Paul's plea, and it applies to us as well, to not forget that we have been changed. Go, therefore, and be reconciled with your brother. Christ has done this for you. We should do this to others. And this final question, what is getting in the way of us seeing the gospel applied for us today? If we see how the gospel has been applied in our hearts, through our lives, we can think also of Christ, who even more than Peter Miller walks beside us as we go through life. He is refreshing us constantly as we come to him in prayer. And we trust that he will walk with us all the way as we journey home. Hopefully you hear the gospel here in this text tonight and that you would see it applied in, through, and for you tonight. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we have you, our advocate, who has placed a pardon on our behalf and we did not deserve it. We're thankful, Lord, for this hidden theme that we see throughout this whole letter. It's in plain sight. Forgiveness. Lord, I pray that we would be those that would forgive others in the littlest things, in the big things, to restore relationships, to be reconciled to our brothers because this is what Christ has done for us. And as we sing the song tonight, as we close, I pray, Lord, that we would remember how you do not remember the wrong we have done, that your blood was the payment, our, that your life was the cost, and we stood beneath, you stood beneath a debt that we could never afford. We're thankful, Lord, that truly our sins, though they are many, your mercy is more. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.